Hello again. This week I'm going to be talking to author Vicky Werner about her near-death experience and the lessons she learned from it. Enjoy. So good morning. Today I am going to be chatting to my beautiful friend um, at the other side of the world, Vicky Werner. Welcome. How are you? Oh, I'm so good. And it's, it's so delightful to see your face. It brings me joy. I want to reach around and hug and kiss like crazy. So. Maybe this social distancing thing is okay for this moment because yeah. I really would love to see your face a little more. I know, I know it is. So um, I'm going to introduce you, Vicky, because you are a highly accomplished um, woman. You are author of The Secret to Healing and Recovery. I remember when you were writing this. You are a life coach. You're a past life um, regression uh, therapist. And your real passion is emotional healing and supporting people through that. Um, I wanted to jump straight in. I obviously know your story um, and certainly the story that you document in, in, in here. But for those people that don't know you and, and don't know a lot about you, um, I'd like to just jump straight in to your near-death experience only because I think it is so powerful um, in bringing reassurance and comfort to people who are controlled by fear around death which we have got a, a, you know an unamplified state right now and and I just wondered if you could talk about it and that experience yeah, absolutely. I think that encompassing fear of death is really the fear of the unknown. Uh, anybody who's had any kind of experience of crossing over, uh, most people tend to long to go back there. Uh, so it's people who are familiar with that experience that they, they, they're hungry for more of, of what they're not feeling in this three-dimensional world. And uh, my experience in a, a lifetime of transformation. I, I think it actually started as early as when I was uh, five years old. My mother was very sick um, and I watched her nearly die. And it took her years to uh, heal. She had a breakdown. She was uh, delivered her seventh child and her body was very weak and fragile. They did a, a hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. And she had a lot of internal bleeding. And the doctor called my father and said, get funeral arrangements. She's not going to make it through the night. And um, witness to that back in the early uh, late 70s, early 80s, which was that was the time, time for me is the early 70s. And uh, back then, there, it wasn't a, a language of understanding how uh, much children are aware of their environment. And so it wasn't a, a social construct to invite children into the conversation. They were seen and not heard, but they weren't really shared in, in the language of what was happening. They were just witness and downloading all of this information without having an adult construct to understand what was happening. Mm -hmm. And I watched my mom very delicately and gingerly uh, navigate her day. She would, could nibble on a little bit of cucumber. She sat on this orange uh, beanbag chair uh, against the, the heat of the window on the big sliding glass door uh, for warmth. And uh, in, my, in my child language, all of those uh, experiences, all those sensory experiences downloaded into me. And I remember the moment where she was walking along the lin linoleum floor in the kitchen, trying to get from one side of the counter to the other, which was about five feet but it took her a while to navigate that. And her body shook and her hands shook. She was just very delicate. And I remember that moment asking myself, am I going to survive this when it's my turn? Now it's the chicken or the egg, right? It's, mm -hmm. did, I, did, I, did I download that from a higher knowing in my innocent or innocent state? Or was it something that uh, I just thought, well, this is gonna be my natural evolution. I better, I better accept it now. I don't know. I don't know how that contributed, but I do know my behaviors throughout my life was pushing myself harder than I should have. And my 
even though there was a lot of biological ways, a lot of physiological ways in my body, the same, you, you push beyond a comfort zone. My reference was I would check to see if my hands were shaking and if they weren't shaking violently, um, I just thought, well, I can push a little harder. And some of that dialogue uh, was anchored in self value for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think up until these last few years, I felt like my level of self value had to do with the deeds that I did. It was, I had to earn my right, my privilege to be in people's lives. And I think that's such a common language and it's ingrained in mothers, right? Yeah. And, and partners. We just think that we, well, our, we're loved because of what we do, not because of who we are. Absolutely. And uh, in 2012, my husband and I uh, were on a journey of really wanting to do some self-discovery. We had experienced a horrible trauma uh, for, with him in uh, years earlier, and we were still in that healing process with that. And so we went to Peru and with uh, my sister, who is a shaman, and uh, so it was a safe environment in that I knew what was going to be taking place. But I, we sat on Monkey Island, uh, 4,000 miles from my home. And, you know, the instruction we were receiving in this circle of friends was asking the divine what it is you really want. You know, some people have, some people wrote amazing books from those experiences of entering the matrix. Some people had some real great downloads and some great healings. My only question and my only hope as I wrapped my arms around myself was help me learn to love myself mm -hmm. and had no idea the Pandora's box that I opened mm -hmm. because I got violently ill. I should have been in the, I should have been hospitalized because I was in such a frail state. I was very, very dangerous state. My husband is a former medical doctor, mm -hmm. so I was in his hands, but I didn't, I didn't get better. I was, I was able to get home, but I, my, my health continued to depreciate over the months. This was in July. And by December of that year, everything started to continue to break down. All of my body just went into a, a hyper sympathetic mode so much that my organs are just saying we're done. And uh, I was at my weakest state. I was about two weeks where I was too, uh, too fragile to even speak words. It was so amazing for me to, to recognize how much energy it takes in, in formal communication. And it, I would say a couple of words and I'm sure you relate. And after that, you're just down for the count because you're, it's just took everything you had. Um, I, my body for about eight months uh, shook violently. And I, I would start the morning okay because I've had some rest, but usually around three. So just in this weakened state uh, and, and severe muscle spasms, I told my husband I needed to go to the emergency room. And uh, he finally acquiesced to take me, although he didn't feel that uh, that was going to be a benefit for me. Um, but we went. And six hours later, they ran a number of tests. I, I was having so many uh, physical responses uh, that it was very obvious. Obvious, I was in a very fragile state. And they came in and um, said it was gastritis and sent me on my way. And I was definitely in a crisis. And I, in, in that moment, I, I knew that allopathic medicine was not for me. It was, it was the teacher saying, uh, I'm not hurt in this area and it's not going to happen. So uh, less than uh, 24 hours later, I was alone in my bed. Um, I, all of a sudden there was a, a, a soft light in my room and I could hear my husband and children down the hall. And instantly I was out of my body standing at the foot of the bed, looking at my, my hair was just very disheveled. It was from pain. I could see my facial expression still uh, held in the intention uh, from pain. And I had a, a great deal of compassion for that person that I felt separate from. Uh, I was then uh, transported to the room where my husband and children were and I could see them and I wanted to connect with them. 
and I was angry that my husband was watching The Simpsons because they were young children. I remember having those, like I'm still a mom, whether I'm in my body or not, and I didn't like that. But um, then I was on a path and my family was there and, and I was later told that path was my own consciousness, my level of uh, taking the journey home. Mm -hmm. And I uh, saw each member of my family and each of them said, it's okay, I'll be okay. Mm -hmm. And I had no control over moving forward. But I kept trying to resist, like, why isn't anybody trying to stop me? Why isn't anybody trying to keep me here? And why are you okay? Because I'm not okay. And mm -hmm. uh, I was went through this very dark kind of a haunted house image for a moment. Uh, it was very dark and dead, uh, what we would say from a Hollywood standpoint of, of a haunted house, but I wasn't afraid. And as soon as I went through this thre threshold, threshold, everything shifted. It became illuminated and lit and beautiful. And I, there was beautiful music and it was very uh, peaceful. Mm -hmm. And there were three uh, beings of light that met me. And uh, one of them was the spokesperson uh, that said that I was crossing over due to a great deal of trauma to the physical body and that uh, I was in a very fragile state and they explained that uh, the reason why they my family said I was they were okay is that on a conscious level they didn't they didn't know that I was that I was leaving the body um, and then at, up until that point I still looked the same as I would uh, and they explained there's many layers to the to the uh, bean, and so my one layer of my body dropped, and all of a sudden I looked like them. I I was light, and uh, there was no really defining uh, characteristics that would di that would differentiate one bean from another. Uh, we just recognized due to the energy of that individual, and then three other ones entered the room, and. Uh, my, I saw my body like an old pair of jeans that were on the floor and my body had dropped and it was just without form. And two of them very gently fit, picked up my body, uh, the outer shell of my body. And then another one had a, a crystal water that they were bathing it and, and trying to instill healing on that level. And I watched them hold it very uh, carefully and very uh, sacredly. Then they took me to uh, an area and said that, that I was being given three gifts. And there was an altar in each of these. There was a large, beautiful altar with a statue, a lot of gold and gems, precious gems. The first one was illuminated. And they said the first gift I was being given was the gift of sight. And in that moment, I saw how each member of my family was going to live out their life without me. And uh, I, uh, they showed me details about how the path would continue for each of them. And then they got to my youngest who was seven at the time and showed me that she struggled the most and had a great deal of trauma and would not progress. And they turned to me and said that I needed to know that if I decided to continue, uh, that she will not live out her life purpose. And uh, that it was my choice, but it was important that I return back to my body in order for her to live out her purpose. They didn't tell me what that was, but I turned to, and I said, I need to go back. So he needs me. I also knew that this was going to be um, a, a long journey and an enormous amount of pain. And it was, and it is still is. I haven't, I can't claim that I'm completely healed eight years later. However, I'm significantly healed and I can maintain a sense of normalcy, which I didn't have for about a year and a half mm -hmm. and, and uh, slowly eased back into a new normal. I would say that uh, I would be the classic uh, archetype of the wounded healer, that you go through so much personal strife and pain that uh, in order to serve the calling of your soul, you have to serve the, serve the calling of humanity. And I think that that's your role as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I definitely remember, uh, I'll always remember reaching out to anybody who potentially could hold my heart for a moment, feeling isolated and alone, scared, 
the only thing I wasn't afraid of is crossing over. I was afraid of being in my body. I was afraid of one more minute of pain, not even another day, but another moment. And I, if I would have known that this would have been the journey that it has been, uh, it would have been a hard choice to come back, but uh, obviously a tremendous amount of growth. Wow. So I um, I've just realized that I've got, and that's really, I'm just going to bring it into this view. It's really interesting that we, um, that it was in um, full view of just you talking about your near death e experience because geez, that's such a profound story, Vicky. It's so profound because, you know, death is so hidden from us it's so it's 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 like we don't talk about it i know there's now the beginning of 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 people starting a, an almost a dwala service for death so that there's a preparation but there's so much fear and i think when fear comes along it can just hijack our lives because we're so frightened of what potentially might happen if we if we die but actually the the real fear is actually about living fully in mm -hmm. the life that we have through the struggles which you then obviously went into can you tell us um i mean i know because i've been in that similar place but the resilience did you realize you had it in you to live every because i know sometimes two minutes was a long time how did you if you had thought about it you know before you entered into this experience would you have thought you'd had the resilience to deal with it i don't think so i i liken it to uh when i was born i'm a tw i'm a twin and my mother had my mother had uh five children that were ages five and under and with twin babies and people would ask how did you do it and she would say you don't have a choice just and she said that that was a 26 hour a day job it just never ended and i and i think that's the case with this you don't have a choice other than to uh build up strength and there's there's glimmers of hope there's moments of freedom that that we can hang on to and sometimes it's a message from a friend sometimes it's a it's a poem that we come across uh sometimes it's uh just an act of grace around you mm -hmm. that gives you freedom to believe that your life can be different than it is and acknowledging what is is a very painful thing to experience and i have to tell you uh, I, I'm sure you uh, know this, but uh, I'll always have you in my heart as one of my sister keepers. And I remember just looking everywhere for answers. And my husband's a beautiful healer. And I would say, and people would say, oh, your husband's such a great healer. He saved my life and he did all of these things. And I would be in such a desperate state saying, please help me, please heal me. And he would felt helpless. He would bring home herbs and parasite cleanses and he would massage me, but it scared him more than it scared me. He didn't know and he felt a sense of helpless state. Mm -hmm. And um, that was very isolating. And I, I remember texting you and yeah. thinking, is there wisdom that you have on the other side of the world that has not made it to me yet? Is, am I, are you privy to something? and i remember that moment of saying you know is there is there some wisdom that you can share and, and you talked about convalescence mm -hmm. and the the role of children and up until that moment i did not know what convalescence really meant i associated it with geriatric care because it was always in the same language uh for the elderly but I, I i received your message i i laid in my bed with my phone and and i remember slithering off. i couldn't even walk at this time and i was alone for the day slithering off my bed it took me 20 minutes to work my way around to the library to get the the uh, dictionary to read convalescence and i held the book against me which was too heavy to hold and i read uh the time needing for healing and i tears just 
I didn't even have control over the tears. I was too weak to even stop them. And they just came on the floor holding that, that dictionary, just yeah. hoping that somehow this nightmare will end. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's, it, it, for me, I remember that I so remember that time. And I, I don't know how, I think I had heard it from a local naturopath um, and she had been talking about, you know, people coming in for the quick fix. Can we, can we have this? And can you give me herbs? And I'm feeling this and I need to get back, you know, into productivity. And she said, we have lost the art of convalescing. And I, and I, I remember reading, I can't remember what I was researching because I'm always researching, but I remember reading about all these convalescent homes where people after the war particularly would be sent and they would just honestly all they would do all day was they'd be brought food they'd be wheeled outside they'd do a bit of art and they just you know have nice conversations family would be brought to, in you know to visit mm. but there were tartan rugs and it all just felt very tucked in and gentle and mm. and I think for me, and I know it will probably for you too, is the struggle of knowing that family life is going on and that you can't be part of it. But I think one of the hardest things that I find, I'd be interested to hear what you say about Scott, especially around him, you know, wanting to fix and bringing something in, was that I remember bursting into tears and saying to Simon, all I want you to do is witness the courage it takes to live in this body doing this that's it i don't need you to fix it i don't need you to fuss or or or, or anything i just need you to see the courage it takes to live through this is that something that scott was able to to do eventually to surrender to the fact that he didn't he wasn't going to be the 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 hero of this story it was actually it was actually you being empowered into your own healing ability that was what came out of this. Well, it's really interesting because uh, my husband is a is a former OBGYN, and as a med as a, a delivering babies, I think most people could relate to the doctor shows up in the eleventh hour. Yeah. In the last fifteen minutes, they'll do a couple of check in. The nurses are who held the space, the nurses who did all of the work, the, 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 the grunt work and the lifting yeah. and uh, all of the communication. And I think how we do one thing is how we do all things. And uh, I recognize that the, the sicker I was, the more he pulled away. And I, I, I can acknowledge that he was afraid. Um, we eventually went, uh, he he we went to hawaii and we were on the beach and, and i said in order to, for me to really start moving forward we need to acknowledge uh that if i were to grade you and how in, how you showed up i would give you a d minus it was almost a fail grade and uh i i said i i love you uh you didn't show up in the way that i needed um however i I'm, I'm giving space to know that each one of us are only capable of what we're capable of. Mm. And in hindsight, I also know it's really, really was my uh, soul saying, I need to do this by myself because what I endure, I'm going to teach others. And I think mm. in my book, I've had so much, so much response about the caregiver section. Yeah, yeah, let's talk about that. I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, and it, it awakened. I was, I was two sides of the same coin because I was the person in bed for, for eight solid months. And I had family members saying I needed to get more doctor visits. I had people who showed up and said, well, you're clearly crying out for attention. And I had family members who didn't interact with me for weeks or months and then show up and give me a laundry list of why they weren't there. I had family members say, oh, I know exactly what you're feeling because I had the worst head cold last week. <laughs> and they were so disengaged from truth. And it was such a beautiful teacher because I was witness of what was being presented and what I really needed. And then Years down the road, I my husband almost died. Uh, he fell and got, had a cyst on the side of his head, 
and uh, it burst and he, uh, his whole side of his head became mushed and he had three surgeries um, and I almost lost him. And it's been three years of his healing journey. And so I know what it's like to be in bed mm -hmm. and feeling part of the 7 million people on this planet and still isolated and alone. And I know what it's like to be the one wondering if your partner's going to wake up tomorrow and, and seeing how their life that you, you aren't okay until they're okay. Mm -hmm. And how you ask a thousand questions. Are you okay? Are you okay? And feeling helpless because there's nothing you can do but hold space. Mm -hmm. And I, that the grasp that I have, that spectrum uh, has been just front and center in the entire school of it. So mm -hmm. it's been a, quite a journey, but um, thank God my husband had uh, the willingness to open his heart to see where there was shadow mm -hmm. and how he could be different. And it wasn't a matter of blaming him or calling him bad or wrong because nobody wants to be shamed into being bad or wrong. Yeah. Uh, but it was an opportunity to say, I need a different version of you to show up in mm -hmm. order for healing mm -hmm. to take place. I'm interested to know about the different types of medicine that you took. And in medicine, I mean, uh, not just, you know, herb supplements, you know, what we normally describe as medicine. Medicine can be that conversation that we had just by text message that suddenly becomes a really powerful medicine. What were the biggest kind of medicines that you used to heal would you say were the kind of the the number you know the first three the top three that yeah. were really the most important for me uh was that uh i used essential oils uh that uh for emotional support uh it was very uh comforting to have a lot of my digestive issues uh, a lot of tenderness and aches, so essential oils were soothing for me. Uh, tapping, or EFT, mm -hmm. uh, tapping was really good to, to unveil some subconscious patterns, and uh, also uh, meditation. Those, mm -hmm. those were, as far as, as, far as tools, uh, mm -hmm. diving in, because I was so hyper uh, sympathetic dominance, mm -hmm. and you know, it took me a long time to recognize it's in the parasympathetic stage where convalescence is possible. And I just kept swimming upstream for way too long. Uh, I, the circle of people close to me, uh, there's three uh, specifically that you and, and two other friends that uh, I felt that were uh, holding my heart and my hand energetically and that I knew that it was safe to say, in this moment, I'm not feeling uh, safe in my body or in my in this moment and I didn't have to use those words but just knowing that we could go six months or a year and not really have a whole lot of dialogue but just seeing each other on social media or just a, a quick little message was saying I see you and it's enough to give me strength yeah yeah I think that that's definitely what came out of my experience was having a sisterhood around mm -hmm. that you could be truly honest with if there was um i had a, a, an experience where when i was driven to the the points where i truly didn't think i could bear it for one more minute i would call in a divine helper and i just wondered which appeared out now i was reading a book and i was like oh really and and i would call in the angel of mercy i got it from the medical medium book which you had put me on to and i had just gone you know what it's like all books you'll pick it up and you don't necessarily need to read it all the, from the beginning to the end you, sure. you can just pick it up and read it and the right thing pops out and for me it was the he had a whole section around angels uh, at the back and it was the angel of mercy. And I would be at points where I truly thought I wasn't gonna be able to take another breath. And I would call in the angel of mercy. I would just say, angel of mercy, angel of mercy, please help me, please help me, angel of mercy. Often I'd be rocking on a foam roller, trying to op open up my chest. And do you know what? Something would shift. Something would oh, shift. Very mean. 
So I just wanted one, thank you for that book, <laughs> because <laughs> you know what, that was your gift back to me. Um, I remember you when you were doing it, me reaching out and going, oh my God, okay, I think I'm in the same state you were in. And you go, okay. And you know, you speaking to me, but, um, and so I'm deeply appreciative of all the, the, the suggestions you gave me, but that was definitely my go-to when I was like, I actually might not make it. Did you have a similar thing at any point? I feel that uh, there were times, um, yes, I did. And I, I feel like there was times where I really wanted to surrender and uh, drop into prayer. I think I had a lot of times where I wanted to run away from my body. And I had these this awakening that no matter how much I tried to escape this experience, uh, I... I recognized it just had the, it just washed over me that no matter what my physical body still had to ride that train out and it, mm -hmm. it taught me to have compassion and I just I, I remember the moment I was trying to do some uh, mindfulness meditation and I could feel this need to run and just my brain thinking where will I go where will I go I, I gotta get out I gotta get out of here I'm in so much pain and then just awakening that is so it sounds kind of bizarre, but it was all of a sudden coming full circle into this experience of loving myself. Mm. And I just wanted to hold my body and say, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that I put you through this. I'm so sorry that you have to endure the inflammation and the pain mm. and that, that, that there's a disconnect from my heart and my body. I'm so sorry that uh, it aches to walk and to carry this burden and that you have to feel the flood of emotions that keep coming in this chemical cocktail of fear and unknown. And it just, it, it just was this surrendering of just saying, it's okay, I'm going, I'm, we're going to do this together. And yeah. so it was more than an external experience. It was more of an internal internal and, experience. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Cause I had that later. I probably had that maybe a year and a half later, the reparenting process started where, where the internal connection started to really forge and form. And I really started to really understand that, um, yeah, that reparenting process where we come to ourselves with kindness and love and, and acceptance, no matter what, it looks like you talked a little bit about um well you didn't talk you talked before we started recording this we started we were talking about you um and your passion for emotional healing can you tell me a bit more about your experience about healing emotions and how it impacts the physical body well yes i I know that uh, we we become emo we become addicted to our emotional state, and when we want to switch out of that, uh, that if we look at the language of the the body is through our emotions, and the language of the of the brain is the mind and the thought process, and uh, when those two are aligned, we can become true creators. We can move forward in our life, but quite often they're out of alignment, especially if we try to enter our conscious mind and consciously try, which we know is only 5% of our day, but mm -hmm. uh, we want to consciously make changes and nobody is going to say on a conscious level, give me whatever it takes to knock me to my knees, do whatever it takes for me to wake up and have, uh, have an experience that changes me forever. Nobody says that. However, the emotional state of the body of just constantly the bombardment and that chemical cocktail that we've just become so addicted to that we identify as who we are. Yeah. And then we layer that with a diagnosis or, or uh, we, a label. And whether it's trauma from rape or, or trauma, of PT I had a horrible PTSD of I would see a commercial of somebody on an Olive Garden commercial like breaking bread and I would have a 
full on panic attack because I was so violently reactive to gluten and uh, to bread. Wow. And I, I had horrific uh, trauma around bread and just when everybody else would eat around me and God bless my husband, you know, he, he his acts of love was occasionally saying, do you want a bite of this pizza? And I would say, that, that isn't loving to me. I know you're trying to be loving, but it's, it's saying that you don't hear me. Uh, mm -hmm. And so as far as emotions, um, a few things that illness does is it permeates every aspect of our life. Mm -hmm. And every decision we make uh, is based on that. That's the first gate we will always check whether it's something we can safely do again, whether we're playing small because our body isn't responding in the way that we were hoping that it would. Emotionally, we feel a sense of grief and a sense of loss of a lifestyle we used to have or long to have. And uh, it also, uh, that sense of uncertainty, nobody can schedule trauma and nobody can schedule when trauma ends. And that's exactly what's going on in this world now. We. We, we didn't get to choose when a pandemic was, we, you know, we didn't mark, walk over to the calendar and say, okay, as of March 16th, everything's off for the next two months. We, we, we weren't able to do that. It showed up and it was navigated towards us. And then it's this level of uncertainty and this realigning and then creating a new normal. And that's how it is with, with, with illness. That's how it is when something changes in your life, a new baby, you know, it's just, all of a sudden they're, they're here and you change your lifestyle. You, you create a new normal. And in order to create a new normal that's healthy, identify the emotions and be real with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I would say when you need to be heard, uh, that, that you can have a few people that are safe to have a conversation with, but it's not fair to the person beside you saying, uh, you know, it, that you're an unleashing, you're just vomiting up all of your emotional state. And sometimes it's really hard for that person to carry. And it's an, it's an injustice to them. But when you know that there's a sister that says, I hear you mm -hmm. and I'm here for you, uh, still navigate that gently that we, we aren't supposed to do it alone. I, I agree a hundred percent, but we aren't supposed to, we aren't, we want, we're not going to heal uh, via somebody else's actions and emotions. It, it has to be that internal journey. And so a lot of journaling, a lot of tapping, a lot of, you know, uh, write and burn. I would do a lot of writing and just scribble. And sometimes it was, it was the paper would tear because there was so much emotion and I would tear it up. And uh, sometimes I had to just make sound so that my, my body and and a voice could just release. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's tears and sometimes it's like a, a, a primal sound mm -hmm. and uh, just being out in nature and just moving energy. If you can move it physically, that's ideal because it's so heavy and, and a lot of our emotional traumas are in the three lower energy centers, the three lower chakras. And so it takes a lot of movement pull those up back out of the body and you have to unlock all of those so that you can get to the heart. And when, when our heart isn't open and when our heart isn't healed and when our heart isn't receptive to ourself or others in a loving state, there's a lot of stuck emotion that needs to come out. And again, you can't schedule when that happens sometimes, mm -hmm. but you can give yourself permission to say, I'm on the journey and today is a win. And, you know, this morning I was going through a lot of my own identity. I was tapping and I was recognizing that a, a, an aspect of my identity has been shifting tremendously. Maybe this is what was divinely orchestrated that I can look back. Mm. But um, in this moment I was tapping and I just felt myself saying, I want to go home. I want to go home. And I was just crying so hard. Uh, and I thought, oh my God eight years later, I want to go back. And I, I that's why I haven't fully healed because I want to still want to go home. And I felt like mm. sacrificial lamb. And, uh, when I, when I felt this energy of saying, I feel picked on, I feel, you know, it's easy to fall into that victim mentality. Oh yeah. And I have this beautiful friend 
who I said, I just feel picked on. I feel, and she said, you were, you were chosen, you were picked. And, mm -hmm. and it was just that little sentence to go, it's going to be okay. Yeah. It's going to be okay. Maybe not forever, maybe not tomorrow, but in this moment, it's going to yeah. be okay. Absolutely. And sometimes it's just a, a, a little nugget of hope that, that we can lean on and sustain us. Yeah. Wow, Vicki, thank you for sharing your story. Um, I, just as you, I just wanted to, to just touch on, on something that I used to do, just as you were talking about those bottom three chakras, and it makes so much sense now, is that I used to, and I, I mean, apparently used to do it in, you know, the mental institutions, but I used to rock um, mm -hmm. my body. I would just rock it back and forward, I'd, either with a Pilates ball, just rocking back and forward, or just literally would be rocking. And I thought, God, I'm like a mad woman here. Isn't this what, you know, people used to do in mental institutions? But as you were saying that, it makes sense. That's how you release it from your lower yeah. chakras and bring it up to yeah. your body and and those were really primal things that would just come to me that I would go I need to just rock my body I don't know why I just would do things so it's really interesting thank you for that reminder because I think it's almost a bit it's like childbirth for all those women out there who have birthed children you just you've got no idea what's about to happen nobody can prepare you for it you have to, the more you can surrender into the process. By my third, I was getting really good at it. I know you've had considerably more children than I have, Vicky. <laughs> <laughs> You're really good at it. But that surrendering process that comes when you know what's about to happen um, just makes everything so much easier because you can let go and trust that the body knows what it needs to do in order to release the child from the yeah. womb. Um, and it's almost the same with those emotions um, that are trapped in your body that have never seen the light of day because they were pushed down because of the environmental situation you were in at the time of not being able to speak about it or, or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And just finding that safe container within yourself to be able to release those and know that you'll be okay. And I think that really speaks to the time we're in right now where a lot of people are finding themselves in the dark night of the soul. There is uncertainty. They don't, they're, they're, people are bored. They don't sit in the mat. They want to not binge on Netflix or whatever, but this is the grandest opportunity people will have to clear these emotional traumas. Um, and traumas is not, doesn't necessarily have to be a rape. It can just be the time that you put your hand up in the classroom and your teacher said, don't be ridiculous. We're not taking questions right now. But you were humiliated by that experience. It's all of those little micro traumas as, as well that we've been given this opportunity to um, explore allow and surrender to that healing process in order to to anchor more light on the universe right now yeah, that's always the goal and right now there's a lot of uncertainty and the the permanence like illness the sense of permanence of when is this going to be over is it going to get worse i i think that the earth is hurting and is has had illness and we're witnessing that we're witnessing it and experiencing it on every level of our body and uh there's so much in the media that uh that is can go very dark and mm -hmm. our level of trust of what information is being given to us whether we can trust it is, is challenging and you, you know with the different reports and and mm -hmm. escalated numbers and there there's so much conflict into what people can do and you know, when, when the world, we're, we're social beings, we're not meant to be alone. And uh, the, the human spirit is, is not meant to be in captivity. And we all feel captive. I mean, I have a beautiful home and a beautiful yard and uh, our, our needs are met. And I'm even with my family and even having all the tools that I have and all of the, the knowledge base that I have, I recognize sometimes I'm like, where am I? I, I gotta go. I, I just like, I gotta get out of here. And I know that if I were in a home where there's conflict, 
Yeah. Oh. If I was in a, and we hear that alcoholism is increased, domestic abuse, sexual abuse, child, uh, all of that's on the rise. Uh, that's a do obviously a great concern. It's only going to increase when people uh, sense of safety is being jeopardized. And of course that is when you can't pay your bills, you don't know when your job's going to be back. You don't know when a set of normal, uh, simultaneously, every one of us have asked for this great pause on a, on an energetic level. Every one of us have said, get me off of this hamster wheel of busy. Every one of us have said, there's not enough time in the day to do everything that I want to do or need to do. We feel this burden of just time right racing. And now everything that we've asked for is some more downtime, some quiet time, some healing time, some family time, some time to be at home to finish whatever tasks it's in front of us. And it's the, be careful what you ask for. And now it's confronted. But we, the reason why I think it, it, it can be upsetting is because it was, without choice from our language you know we didn't get to choose when i took the time off it was yeah. it was you know dominated upon me from an authority that, that i don't know if i can trust or not but there's a few things that i highly recommend that astrologically this time in history has never existed before and uh from from an astrological standpoint there's certain uh planetary alignments that were very pivotal time in history on a singular level but now there's five of those all and it's we're talking about the the when big huge uh, world wars were going on when the great depression was going on when mm -hmm. different uh things were taking place so astrologically there's influence yeah. of transformation yeah. and so whether we engage in that or how it hits our chart whatever uh there's still influence of transformation and we all know the caterpillar butterfly experience there's a messiness in the dissolving of the old and it's tight and constricting and isolating yeah. and scary of the unknown mm -hmm. but there is beauty that was within our reach and in order to get that please take care of your body and don't don't be going into sabotaging behaviors sabotaging thoughts uh, binge watching things that just numb our, our body. I'm, I'm really waking up to, to the language of, of programming and watching a show is a program. And when we are normally we'll watch television to turn off our mind. I remember I'm like, I just need to watch something entertaining to turn off my brain. Mm -hmm. But that's when we want to turn off our thoughts. We, we want to turn off, which that drops us in the alpha state and we're very receptive. Yeah. So we, we can be very programmed by commercials. We can be programmed by the media and fear. We can be programmed by the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. And uh, we're, so we don't even realize that we're, we, we don't have control over our thoughts. If you can be out in nature get out in nature as much as possible, mm -hmm. eat live food, keep your body in movement. Even if you're in home, you can certainly turn on music and dance mm -hmm. and uh, lift your spirits, be conscious about it. Uh, meditation, if, you, if it's not a practice with you right now, integrate it, even if it's just for a few moments. And then recognize that life isn't an on and an off switch. There's a, there's a, a range from that. So that we can be somewhat on, somewhat off. So each one of those are just some, some level of awareness. So integrate awareness into your life. Just choose to be aware, choose to be conscious. You hear the language that people are asleep, choose not to be that. <laughs> and and uh, don't separate from the whole. We're, we're, all, we're all one organism and have compassion when there's someone struggle. Don't take things as a direct hit emotionally and then work on yourself in whatever ways if it's physical if it's emotional if it's spiritual whatever way you want to integrate better self-care it's going to affect other aspects of your life mm. and then it whatever you are in in this pause figure out where you want to go and do it consciously rather you know rather than letting someone else determine where you're coming where your next step is be conscious about it create it from being a vibrational match to that yeah yeah, I agree. Thank you so much for your time today. 
I really feel that the message and the, the stories that you've shared today will, will hugely benefit um, humanity at this time. Um, and I'm so, so very grateful for you taking the time out of your day to spend time chatting to me. Thank you. My pleasure. I love you endlessly. Bye.